Hi, welcome to Word from Jerusalem. I'm Ray Ramirez, creative director for the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem, and I'm here at the Pi Serena, home of the annual Feast of Tabernacles. Since the celebration began in 1980, Christians from around the world have gathered annually to celebrate this biblical feast right here in Jerusalem. Today, some 35 years after its inauguration, more than 80 nations are gathering in this arena to observe this exciting feast. So now let's go join in with our brothers and sisters from around the world to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles.
Welcome to the World from Jerusalem here from the Pace Arena at the Feast of Tabernacles. We have today a very special guest with us, the Reverend Dennis Belkham, who was serving as a missionary in Hong Kong and mainland China for more than 40 years. His ministry impacted millions of people in China and has become one of the main leaders of the revival, which is taking place in this great nation over the last couple of decades. Dennis, it's a great privilege for us to have you with us Thank tonight. Thank you. Honored to be here. Well, Dennis, I heard today you got saved at a very young age. Tell us a little bit, what was the transforming moment for you? Well, I was brought up in a liberal church. I didn't believe in miracles. And when I was 16 years old, I went to a spirit-filled church and heard people speaking in tongues, languages mm. that I recognized or other people recognized. I saw them heal the sick. I'd never seen a miracle. Wow. And I, hey, God is true. The Bible is true. And I said, I'm going to serve the Lord. And I gave my life to the Lord to be a minister. Well, praise God. And I understand at a very young age, you have been still a teenager. You received a call to China. That's right. Well, when I said I'm going to be a minister, I thought, well, I can't stay here in America. You know, they've heard the gospel. There's Christian television and radio. Even at those age, that was 1961. So I said, I must go to some other nation. What nation should I go to? I thought about Africa and India, mm -hmm. you know, exciting and animals and everything, new culture, but there was no witness. And then one day I'm studying in the book uh, Encyclopedia, see an article on China, and I heard God say very specifically, you're going to go to the People's Republic of China, and I'm going to open the door for that nation. So wow. I was 16 years old, and I knew I'm going to go to China someday. Now, this was at a, at a time when communism was at a peak in China. Yes. And to go as a missionary to this country, it's impossible. How did God open the well, door for you? China wasn't, of course, open. Now, I went to Vietnam. I was a soldier. And uh, in that year, I went to Hong Kong on a vacation. Out of four million people, the Lord brought a prophet to sit down right beside me on the boat. And he prophesied, you must come back and start a church because one day the doors of China will open. Mm. So that was 1968, 1969. I came back. I learned the language quite quickly, about seven months. And I started a church called Revival Christian Church. And I said that one day the doors to China will open. Now, we can go to China. There were no tourists, no mm. missionaries, of course. And we didn't even know anything about the church in China. But one day in 1978, Deng Xiaoping, the leader, he was a former He opened the China. And I've been working there since then. Well, praise God. And over those years, I believe you saw a dramatic change in China taking place. I remember when I was growing up in a church as a kid, they always prayed for those poor Chinese Christians. Mm. And we always thought it's this tiny remnant of people left over. But you saw something else taking place. Yes. Well, they met in their homes. They're called the house church. People called the underground church. Not really underground, but not official. But the church grew so strong. And Christians are hardworking. They pay their taxes. They obey the law. They're not involved in immorality or, you know, smuggling or taking drugs. And so the Christian influence was so powerful. And now the Christian churches come from the villages to the cities. And now they build huge churches. There are some official churches. Some are not even official, but the government allows them to build these huge churches. They may have six, 7,000 people coming on any weekend. And Christianity now is coming out. It's blossoming everywhere in China. Mm. Praise God. The, 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 they speak today about more than 100 million born-again believers in China. Can you confirm that? Yeah, well, it would seem to be so. I just showed a video here, you know, in one city where over 10% of the people were Christians. But uh, 26 years ago, it wasn't even 1%. Mm. See, this church growth is taking place all over China. Not every place. Now, the Western areas like where the Mongolians or the Tibetans or the Uyghurs are, very few Christians, maybe not even 1%. But the coastal areas and central parts of China like Henan and Anhui, maybe up to 10%. And so if you take the average all over China, it's probably 8 to 9%, which would be about 100 million Christians which probably makes the largest indigenous church from all the nations. Yes. Well, if you have this phenom phenomenal church grow in China, what do you believe was the main key for people to embrace Christianity in such huge numbers? Well, great persecution came, you mentioned the Cultural Revolution. It came against all religions. But you think in the Bible, there's Elijah on Mount Carmel. He builds mm. the altar. The worshipers of Baal built their altar. And he says, you pray to God and I'll pray to Yahweh and let the God that answers by far be God. So what happened? 
all religions were persecuted. The, the Buddhists prayed to all their Buddhist gods, but nothing happened. The Christians prayed to God, and the Lord protected them, did miracles, and the people said, hey, this is a real God. Now, especially the miracles as Christians went out, not famous evangelists, but mm. individuals went out and healed the sick. So most people in China asked them, why do you become a Christian? They said, because of some miracle I either saw or heard about. And that was the work of the Holy Spirit, the power mm. of God released in this persecuted church that now has come out to be an open church is one of the reasons for this great revival. So people understood that it's not just a philosophy or a, another That's teaching, right. but it's the power of God which is behind it. But isn't this something which is missing also in our Western churches today? That's right. You know, well, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was of Nazareth, was a man anointed to do these great things that he wants to anoint us, you see. But we always look to some famous evangelist or something very supernatural. But, you know, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, healing the sick, a discerning of spirits, a word of knowledge, a word of faith, that's the tools that we are given mm. to do the work of the ministry. And that's what I, I actually go to China. They call me a teacher in Chinese. It's a lao shi, uh, but I'm xie sheng, which means a student. I mm. go to learn from them. Mm. I may bring them Bibles, but every time I'm in China, I'm learning from the oh. simplicity, the prayer, and, of course, they're honoring the Holy Spirit. Well, I know there are people from all over the world watching us, people from Europe and the United States. And as they hear all this, I know there is a hunger in their heart. We want to have this in our churches. We want to see mm -hmm. those miracles in our lives. What would you tell them? What is the key to see this great power of God moving? Well, the first thing is be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Mm. There will be a fluent tongue that God will give you. Other people may understand it, but God certainly does pray in the Holy Spirit because you're interceding. You're building yourself mm. up on your mouth face. And then simply go out and share Jesus Christ. There's, you don't have to stand on the street corner and be offensive to people. There's many ways to share Jesus Christ. Mm. And especially when there's non-believers, God will give you a word of knowledge and you will pray for them and you will see them healed. It's, this is this every single member of the body of Christ is really a missionary and wow. evangelist. And that's what I learned from China, you know, not the famous big guys. And, you know, we have the technical, you know, the videos, and that's just great. But the thing is, each believer is doing the ministry. It's the simplicity of the gospel. That's right. And the priesthood of all saints, which that's is right. the, the theme priesthood of... of all saints. Yes. That's a, was part of the Reformation message. Exactly. Yes. Well, if you talk about this revival and the signs and wonders which are taking place, you mentioned this morning some amazing stories you yes. said you heard Chinese people n not knowing any Western language quoting the Bible in uh, Oxford English. Tell us a little well, bit what you... That's right. I was in a <clears throat> meeting and there's, I'm the only person that is a Westerner. None of the people speak a word of English. And the guy, I hear someone speaking beautiful Oxford English with a you know, British accent and is quoting different Psalms. You know, O Lord, thy goodness to fill the heavens and the earth. We worship wow. thee for thee. And Shakespeare in English, and the guy doesn't know the word of English. But once I went to a place called Ludenschneid in Germany, mm -hmm. you know, Brother Walter Heinrich, yes. and they had a big get ready conference, and there's a, they're praying, and I hear a lady speaking in Chinese, but I don't understand what she's saying. And so we had a Chinese uh, group, you know, Jackie Pollinger, and they brought a lot of people, mm -hmm. and this Chinese person said, I know what she's saying. I'm from a city called Chongqing, it's a city in Central. She's speaking in perfect Chongqing dialect, so this blonde head, you know, white <laughs> German, maybe 16 years old, never been out of China. She's speaking influent dialect of China. This is a miracle. So, see, that's say some people, they have these so-called stuttering, you know, lips, whatever. You know, it's fine. Maybe they're beginning. But God wants to give you a fluent tongue because you're interceding and praying and worshiping. And this, of course, is a great sign to me. But many Chinese have, we've had this many times happen mm. in China. And you know what I see here also, the Feast of Tabernacles. We have every morning altar calls. And the first people which run forward are the Chinese That's people. Right. There seems to be an incredible hunger for God in their hearts. Yes. You see... The Lord used communism in a way it's a blessing because it wiped out all the false religions and it's like a white sheet of paper. There's nothing there. So it's a great spiritual hunger. Mm. You know, materialism doesn't satisfy. Mm. The other gods don't answer. They fake gods. And so the Chinese have a great hunger. So wherever you see them there, like the video I showed this morning, you know, you're preaching, they run to the front. Everybody wants to be prayed for. And we thank the Lord for the hunger that he's put in the hearts of his people. Well, you shared this morning something about uh, a phenomenon which is taking place in China. It's not only the big church grow and the power of 
of God moving there. But there is something which is called back to Jerusalem. What is that? That's right. Well, back in the 1940s, the Chinese in the eastern part of China, more developed and more educated, had a vision to take the gospel, first of all, to the unreached people in the western part, which are Muslims, Tibetans, Mongolians, you know, mm. these people, because China itself has a lot of unreached people. And then from there to Central Asia, and then to the Middle East, and eventually back to Jerusalem. Not that they're trying to convert the people in Jerusalem, but this is Acts 1-8, the opposite. It began in Jerusalem, went to the ends of the world, mm. and now from the ends of the world, going to go back to Jerusalem. They believe in that the gospel has gone around the world. Every ethnic group has heard the gospel and Jesus will come back. Now, of course, this is probably mostly reaching Muslims and mm. Hindus and Buddhists and communists. And so this is the goal. So now every single year, I don't know how many thousands of people, even probably now there's thousands of Chinese in Israel. So they're praying for that. They're not just praying, they're worshiping, but they want to be involved in missions, you mm. know, in supporting and sending out missionaries and whatever they can do. So this is the called the missionary view, vision of the Chinese church. It's called the Back to Jerusalem Mandate. So what you are saying is that there are missionaries from China today in places like Pakistan, yeah, Saudi definitely. Arabia and all that. See, the Chinese are government is everywhere, you know, helping these third world nations, building railroads and airports and infrastructure, and they send a lot of their mm. people out. Now, some of them, of course, are Chinese, but because of the good relation, Christian Chinese, I mean, but some of the good relations between these African nations, Middle Eastern nations and China means that Chinese are welcome to go. Mm. And even, they cannot maybe get a missionary visa, but they can go to even some of these Muslim nations as workers. And so the Chinese church, we have many working in Pakistan right now already, learning the language and in Jordan and Egypt and other places. So this is really practical. You know, it used to be Americans were the number one missionary sending nation, Koreans after that. But I believe in the next 10 to 20 mm. years, you will see the majority of the missionaries from China. Well, praise God. Well, the theme of this year's Feast of Tabernacles was Reformation. How do you see Reformation being played out with this great revival in China? Yeah, well, the Catholics were wonderful people. Uh, they suffered for the Lord. They built schools and hospitals. They were in China from the 16th century. Mm. But they didn't really convert a lot of people because their message, you know, was a message of faith by works. And the Reformation... And no Holy Spirit in the, it. The, yeah, that's right. It's, you're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And then, of course, the Reformation in the, in the 16th century was just part of God restoring other truths, you know, uh, water baptism and, and sanctification and healing and missions. But then in the 20th century, God restored the truth of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And later on in the latter rain revival, worship and praise and the fivefold ministry. See, so this part of Reformation is not just Martin Luther's, mm. you know, justification by faith. It's the truth being restored. And so now there's actually 95% of all the Christians in China are Protestants, not Roman wow. Catholics. But before they're Roman Catholics. So this proves the Reformation message is the message that gets people saved. Well, praise God. Well, we have just a few moments. If you would like to talk to our audience directly, whatever the Lord places in our heart, maybe you start off in Chinese, and then if yes. you give us the, the same in English. Okay. Uh, well, I thank the Lord that I'm privileged to come to Jerusalem and to take part in this uh, Feast of Tabernacles convocation. I uh, and I hope that you'll all pray for our nation, China, and for the church in China, because we have the largest nation, about 1.4 billion people, and a lot have not still heard the gospel. Uh, and I would like also to invite you, if you have the chance to come to China, visit China and bless China because you will see a great revival in China. I like to end just in a very simple phrase that is, may God bless you. Amen. Amen. You are speaking Chinese in your yes. family, I just That's right. My, my children, I've never spoken English. My wife, who's an American, we only speak Chinese at home because, see, the missionary means to 
bond with the people. Yes. So we went to China and we bonded with the Chinese. If people want to support your ministry, how can they do Yeah, well, we have a website as simple as rcmi.ac. My ministry is called Revival Chinese Ministries International, so rcmi.ac. So just get on the website and there's uh, you can support by credit card or whatever, you know, or there's books that you can order. There are You'll be blessed. So, and remember to pray for us. Amen. Well, praise God. Well, if you want to be part of the great revival in China, Revival Chinese Ministry is the ministry to be involved. It was a great time today with you. It's inspiring to hear what God is doing in China. But I do believe that God is able to do the same in every single country of this Amen. world. This is the world from Jerusalem today. Thank you so much for watching us. And thank you so much, Dennis, thank for being you. with us today. In 1980, the Israeli parliament passed a law declaring a united Jerusalem as the eternal capital of the State of Israel. Threatened by the Arab League with an oil embargo, national embassies in Jerusalem closed their doors, 
That same year, Christians from around the world gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Sensing the isolation of the Israeli people, the participants and leaders of this gathering decided to establish the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem. The International Christian Embassy Jerusalem is since more than 30 years right here in Jerusalem to connect the global church with the nation of Israel. For many Jewish people throughout the centuries, the only face of Christianity, what they experienced, was the ugly face of anti-Semitism, of Christians persecuting the Jewish people wherever they found them. As Christian Embassy, we are here in Israel to show a new face of the church, a new face of Jesus Christ to the Jewish people. The mission of the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem is fourfold to educate the global church about Israel through events, television programs, and print publications, to promote Christian celebration in Israel and around the world through the annual Feast of Tabernacles celebration, to mobilize the worldwide body of Christ in prayer for Israel, influencing global leaders and ICEJ representatives in over 80 nations and to show compassion to the people of Israel through social projects that are changing lives in every sector of Israeli society. To learn more about the ICEJ and how you can partner with us, visit ICEJ.org. Well, we've had a wonderful time here in the Feast of Tabernacles meetings, uh, wonderful worship, great word, the presence of God. And I invite you to come next year, 2016, in the month of October. Register soon and be a part of this great Feast of Tabernacles 2016.